because that, this is a real <laughs> big hot buzz item in how to get fat, healthy fats. Um, typically, um, your caloric consumption, and you probably know this, that fat has nine calories per gram, and protein and carbohydrate only have four calories per gram. So fat's, by definition, a calorically dense food, right? It has more than twice as many calories per gram as the other protein and carbohydrate, the other two. So how to choose healthy fats? Because you do need some fat. You can't live without fat. But we need to how, how to keep it limited. We would really like to see, ideally, your fat consumption somewhere in the neighborhood of um, 17 to 25% of your total, total caloric intake. That's a pretty hard achievable number. Weimar does it. Um, and I, I think the number that they achieve is somewhere in the neighborhood of 17% on their therapeutic diet. But that's no added fat in anything. Okay, did you get that? They don't add fat to anything. There's no fat in the bread. There's no fat, fat in the dressings. dressings. Those are areas, there's no fat in anything. They're just getting the fat in the, and in fact, some therapeutic diets, in fact, Dr. Caldwell Esselstein, who was one of the guys in Forks Over Knives, if you remember him, mm -hmm. um, he doesn't even recommend consuming nuts because of the fats in the nuts when he's on that therapeutic diet. Um, that's a very strict regimen, not something we'd recommend for somebody who doesn't have documented coronary heart disease, but it has been shown documented proof that it reverses disease. And that's huge, because up until this point, nobody believed that you could reverse coronary heart disease. You might halt it, stop it, but you wouldn't reverse it. And he's proven reversal, and that's huge. So what is a healthy fat? There are basically two kinds of fats. There's healthy fats. Well, it's pretty simple. There's healthy fats and unhealthy fats, right? So the healthy fats are the polyunsaturated fats. They're essential for life, and these are the Linoleic acids, they're found in corn, safflower, sunflower, the alpha linoleics found in soy, flax, and walnuts, and the monounsaturated fats, which are found in olives, canola, avocado, nuts. And we could go into the chemistry of this, and that's probably for a different point, and they probably will be going to that for the delivery of a health program to the community. It's just important to tell you that these poly just means many, many unsaturated sites on this fat and one unsaturated site on this fat, mono versus poly. The unhealthy fats, and it's really simple, and this, well, it's not really simple. Basically, a fat, if it's a solid at room temperature. Now, there are some exceptions, and we'll talk about coconut oil. That, that's a great exception, because coconut oil is not an animal fat. Coconut oil is a naturally occurring fat. What is the melting point of coconut oil? Does anyone know? Body tip. Body tip. It's described as either 76 or 78 degrees. That's, that's the right answer. I think the right answer is 76. It just depends on who you... It, so at 76 degrees, what's the temperature right now out here? It's about 76 degrees, isn't it? So at, at this temperature, um, coconut oil would become a solid if the temperature was going down. Coconut oil would be a solid at this room temperature or a liquid, depending on if, it, if you're on the way up or the way down. So this would fall into the category of, of unhealthy fats or solid fats. These are typically the saturated fats and they're mostly from animal origin. Why is butter a solid? Anybody? Why is it? Because it's saturated. It's, it's that simple. If it's a solid at room temperature, it's most likely a very unhealthy fat. The trans fats are are human originated fats that are profoundly particularly unhealthy. So when you see, you know, in fact, Whole Foods, many years ago, Whole Foods had this policy, no trans fats. You could, anything on their shelves were purportedly documented. Now I've found some examples where that wasn't true, but their goal is no trans fats. So you could go there, you know, and some people, you know, kind of joke, instead of Whole Foods, it's called Whole, whole Paycheck. Um, mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not cheap. But sometimes eating healthy is not cheap. And we have m methods and mechanisms for getting around that. And we'll talk about the finances of eating healthy. Because one of the biggest objections people have of eating healthy is that it costs too much, right? In a recent NPR study, in a, in a, in a group of people that they surveyed, they said it was easier, people found it easier to do their income taxes than it was to cook healthy. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
I kind of like doing big taxes, but I also like cooking healthy. I think they're both pretty easy. But, you know, in a survey of Americans, now, so we have a job, and our job is to show people how to eat healthy in an easy manner for an inexpensive amount of money. There was also a recent study that said it is now cheaper to eat at a fast food restaurant than it is to cook at home. You're, you're saying yes, you've heard that story. I actually looked at that story. They looked at a story and they, they showed that it was, it was about $5.21 to get a McDonald's meal that an adult would consume. And they compared that to some things. And the amazing thing is this is what they compared it to. They compared it to a processed packaged food serving four people. Because they basically said four people. So this would be something you would buy from the freezer case or buy in a package and you would slap in a microwave. And that was the comparison. But then there have been some other studies and they go, if you took beans, and they actually took beans from a can, they didn't even take dry beans, which would be the cheapest way to cook it, and rice, and you got a complete protein, a pretty good meal, put some veggies with it, and you got a very healthy meal, and they did it for one-fifth of the cost of the meal at McDonald's. So you also have to be careful what you read, and make sure you go read it and see what it's really saying. Because it is not cheaper to eat at a fast food restaurant. It is not. I don't care what they say, go look at the study, and then prove them wrong. The, physiologi the physiologic effects of fats on the body, saturated and trans fats, this is all the things they do. And they're all bad, by the way. It raises cholesterol, it raises your blood pressure, it lowers the HDL levels, it increases the risk for, oops, for heart disease, stroke, certain cancers, and diabetes. Now, this is what healthy fats do. They lower the cholesterol. This raises, this lowers. It helps to maintain healthy HD level. HDL, these are the good, this is the good um, portion of your cholesterol. Provides the body with essential fatty acids. And by the way, um, there are four vitamins that are fat soluble. You guys know these. The ADEC vitamins, A, D, E, and K, they are fat soluble. If you're consuming no fat, you're gonna have a really hard time getting A, D, E, and K. So, you know, for having a no-fat diet or no-fat meal, if, a, if something says no-fat, I can tell you it has no A, D, E, or K in it. Because mm -hmm. A, D, E, and K are fat-soluble vitamins. Unless they somehow figured out a way to get them in there. Lower the, it lowers the risk for heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. That's what unsaturated fats do. So making fat choices. The poor choices lead to all these bad things. And these high cholesterol, high saturated fats, high trans fats, solid fats, and these are animal source fats. These are all poor choices. These are the healthier choices. Notice it didn't say healthy choices. Hmm. What did it say? What is the word there? Healthier. It's healthier choice. So keep that in mind. When you're talking about fat, be careful, because what we're talking about, again, our analogy, we're fishing. And we bring them in slowly. So these are healthier choices. It may not be the healthiest choice. The word there is healthier choice, and that's the key word, and that's what you need to remember. We have to understand the audience that we're speaking to. If I was giving you guys a health lecture for you personally, I would alter what I would deliver. This is a message delivered to the secular world, to your community members, people who have no idea what fat is except it's something you cut off of your steak. That's what they think fat is. They see it and they cut some of it off or they actually eat it. They gristle and the fat and they love it. It's barbecued. So these are healthier choices that are cholesterol-free, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, alkalinic, linoleic fatty acids, and these are vegetable source fats. They're healthier choices. The goal for good health is not to eliminate all fats, but rather to eat less of those that are damaging to the body. Again, we're reeling them in. We're trying to fish, we're trying to get them into the boat. We eat moderately of healthier fats. Moderation in all things. Vegetable oils, unhydrogenated, and plant foods containing healthy fats, nuts, seeds, olives, avocado, flax meal, soy, and others. There's fat contained in most everything you eat. It just some has higher concentrations. This is comparison of fats from animal plant sources, and the red is the saturated fat. And the reason that coconut oil is a solid at room temperature 
is because of the percentage of saturated fat. This is coconut oil is higher in saturated fat than butter. It's a hashing higher in everything. Notice canola here, and this is the monounsaturated. This is the linoleic, and this is linolenic. So that's just a, a comparison of the fats that you'll be exposed to in an American diet. This is composition of vegetable oils and starting with butter going down to safflower. And we're not saying that any one of these are clearly the best choice and you should focus on this and eat that. The goal is to limit, completely limit the fat intake that you add to your meals in all things. But this is just educational to show you what the makeup of these vegetable oils is. Does that make sense? This is relative risk of heart disease, coronary heart disease. Whenever you see CHD, that's coronary heart disease. And this is total fat intake as a percent of total calories based upon quintiles. Quintiles means five, quint being five, and so it breaks them into five different groups. And this is total fat intake as a percent of calories and relative risk of heart disease. And you'll notice that there's not much difference there. Is that kind of surprising to you? We'll go on and we'll, get, we'll go on and show you. This is saturated fat. Now, look at this. So this is total fat intake. Didn't really seem to have much of an impact on coronary heart disease. But let's look at saturated fat. There is a difference. Saturated fat intake and mortality from heart disease. This is a health professional study. 42,000 men free of disease at the start. Saturated fat intake and risk of death from heart disease in a six year follow up. So, this is how the study was constructed. And this is the quintiles. This is the top fifth, and this is the bottom fifth based upon saturated fat intake. And it's a significant difference for your risk of heart disease tracking these people for six years. Those eating the most saturated fat had a 72% increased risk of heart disease. So, it is significant. So if you just look at the total fat intake, it doesn't seem to have much of a statistical difference. But if you break that fat down and then say, let's look at the saturated fat, it does make a significant difference. This is polyunsaturated fat as a percent of calories based upon quintiles. And you notice that there's a fairly linear relationship. It's not huge, but it is statistically significant. This is trans fats as a percent of calories. And again, a linear relationship based upon quintiles. And this is trans fatty acids in coronary heart disease. Um, and this is based upon in thirds, tertiles, tertiles actually, um, and a double risk, two times risk in the, in the worst third as compared to the best third, a doubling in the risk. This is interesting, saturated fat in breast cancer. And this is high saturated fat and this is low saturated fat, and they also compared it to, to low meat. And there was a 20% difference. The conclusion is um, a high consumption of animal fat increases the risk for breast cancer. Goal number one. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Eat less saturated fat. It almost makes me sick looking at the plate there. Um, the primary source of saturated fat in the diet is red meat, and then it lists all those. Um, fast foods, um, baked goods, snack foods, you know, when we tell people to shop, and we actually have a program specifically later on in how to shop, and we basically say, keep on the periphery of the grocery store and think about what's out there. The fresh fruits and vegetables and the grains, the breads, the cereals, the things in the middle of the store are made up of boxes and frozen foods, processed foods. Mm -hmm. And you look at the box, and we teach people how to read labels. You know, you can look at a box, and it's not uncommon to have 12 things in that box. You know, McDonald's just started um, selling oatmeal, and they had a big press release. There are, I, I can't remember the exact number, I think there's like 14 ingredients in their oatmeal. <laughs> 14, now, I thought, when I make oatmeal, it's like oatmeal and water, <laughs> dash of salt. Isn't that how you make oatmeal? What are the other 12 things that went in? They're preservatives, processed, things that you really don't want to consume. So just because 
you it sounds like a healthy thing just because it sounds like it's something you can get a healthy alternative be very careful cook it in your kitchen it'll be a lot cheaper and it'll be clearly more healthy and you know what went into it and that's why we really tell people you know you you know learning how to make your own bread that's actually an art that many Americans have totally lost and if you go back 60 years, we say, if you ate like your great-grandparents, we used to say grandparents, but we're now saying great-grandparents. If you ate more like your great-grandparents, now, that's not always true, because some of them died in their 50s of coronary heart disease because of their life choices, but if we ate like them, cooked like them, if we preserved canned foods, you know, getting back to nature, cooking things that you picked out of your own garden, you know, that is really what lifestyle modification is all about, because not only did you cook it, and it came out of your own garden, but you had to go exercise to get it into the garden. You had to actually put it there. You actually had to go out there and work the soil. You had to get out and get some sunshine, and get fresh air, and you got to exercise. And then you got to eat the toil of your labor. This is beef intake and heart disease, and this is a no-brainer. In fact, most people who eat beef know this. Um, I have a story that just I just heard about last week, and Dr. Gross would be very interested in this. He probably knows the person that I'm talking about if I describe enough to him. This guy came to a New Start program very recently, and he lives back in Western Kentucky, and he owns seven McDonald's franchises. Wow. Now that's interesting because McDonald's franchises are not cheap and they're very lucrative. So you know that this guy's worth a lot of money, and he told a very close friend of mine who's a physician in in Lexington, Kentucky. He said, "I'm going to have to sell my business. I'm killing people." And he was serious. He got the message. You know, this stuff is killing people, and he doesn't feel morally that he can keep doing it. And he's, he's you know, says, I, I'm going to have to sell all these McDonald's franchises because they are killing people. Hmm. We've seen this picture already. This is moderate atherosclerotic disease of coronary artery. And when we see it in coronary arteries, remember, there, the disease of atherosclerosis is not a disease that just loves to go to the coronary arteries. The reason it's a problem in the coronary arteries is these are moderate to smaller vessels. The really big vessels like the aorta get the same or even more atherosclerosis, but it's such a big vessel, you have to put a lot down before it actually starts slowing down the flow. But when you see this in the coronary artery, it's everywhere in your body, in your brain, in your neck and the carotid arteries, down in your arms, your peripheral vascular disease, people who can't walk because they have peripheral vascular disease, it's because the superficial femoral arteries get completely blocked and they get all these collateral flow. They have this disease all through their body and it doesn't just affect the coronary arteries. Their whole body system is being com compromised. Their thinking processes are being compromised. I mean, I've done studies, there are basically four vessels that go to feed your brain. You know about the carotid arteries, but you have two paired vertebral arteries that come up through the vertebral bones. So you have actually four arteries that feed your brain, okay? You have a left and right carotid artery and a left and right vertebral artery. I've seen patients that had both vertebral arteries completely blocked and one carotid artery completely blocked. They had one carotid artery that was 80% closed. Now, do you think that person can think very well? Now, we know a couple things about this person already. There is a, what we call a circle of Willis. There's a connection of blood vessels at the base of your brain that if they're all together, it's a circle. So any blood vessel that comes up will go and, and like a manifold, it will distribute blood to everything. Now, some people don't have a complete circle of Willis. So if they had that kind of disease, they would have a major stroke or die. But this person had a complete circle of will, so that one vessel that was only 20% open was feeding the blood supply to his whole brain. Do you think this person got lethargic? <laughs> yeah! Do you think he had good mental ca acuity, capacity? No! You know, he's kind of nodding off in church. Well, sometimes the, piece, the reason they're nodding off in church is there's no blood in their brain. <laughs> and this same disease occurs everywhere in the body. And the same disease process that can be halted and reversed through proper health choices affects your thinking, your mentation, your walking, your, the blood vessels that go to your splanchnic circulation that absorb your food, everything in your whole body, your renal arteries. We see people with 
renal vascular hypertension, people who have high blood pressure, and it's because one of their arteries, or, or both their arteries, are narrowed. And what happens is the kidney is what controls the blood pressure. And the kidney says, hey, uh, I, I need more blood. I need more pressure. You, you're not giving me enough blood because you have this vessel that's blocked to it. And so it, said it kicks out chemicals that increase the blood pressure until finally the kidney says, okay, now I'm finally happy. Now you're finally giving me enough blood. It wasn't the blood pressure that was the problem. The problem was it had a conduit going to the renal, the renal artery who was narrow. And through this disease process, you can get a different source of hypertension. You can get hypertension that's called renal vascular hypertension. And that's a nasty blood pressure because it's very hard to control through medication, almost impossible. The best thing is just don't get the disease. This is cholesterol and heart disease. This is serum cholesterols. And this is heart disease death rates based upon serum cholesterol. Um, and I'm trying to, this is heart disease death rate. So this is what the cholesterol is. And you'll notice, um, actually, this is very interesting. At 160 blood cholesterol, which would be considered, by the way, is that a healthy cholesterol? We would say it is. Dr. DeRose would be probably pretty happy if he had a patient come in, their cholesterol is 160. Is this person's risk for coronary heart disease zero? No. We used to think that 200 was a good number. 200, your risk is still 12%. There is a number at which we don't see any coronary heart disease. Wouldn't that be the number you wanted? Is that number 160? No. No, it is not. That number is somewhere south of 150. In fact, it's somewhere around 135, where at some point in time, we effectively don't see any coronary heart disease. So that's what we would decide as, now again, we're fishing, we're trying to bring people in, 160 is a whole lot better than 300, right? But 160 is still not disease-proofed. We can disease-proof people. We can give you a lifestyle which will basically say, you will never get that disease. Wouldn't that be great? Mm -hmm. Can I tell a person at 160 that they will never get coronary heart disease? No, I cannot. We see plant-based diet choice people with cholesterols that are 80. Not uncommonly. That doesn't mean that's where you should get, but if you're on a plant-based diet and you're exercising, you should commonly see your cholesterol below 120. And you will therefore guarantee effectively, with, with few exceptions, you would guarantee, you would prove yourself against getting this very nasty disease that kills many Americans every year. Is that good news? Yes. It should be. Now, getting there can be the more difficult news. And again, it's about lifestyle choices. Look at the risk. If your cholesterol is 300, you're up here at 40%. This is a cholesterol-lowering diet. In four weeks, the average serum cholesterol level dropped 29%. Triglycerides dropped 40%. The main foods were, guess what? New start. Fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, bread, cereals, soy, non-dairy non-fat dairy, we would probably, you know, again, we're fishing and an egg substitute because we're trying to transition people. But you could actually improve it even more. Um, I do a program, in fact, Dr. DeRose can, can tell you a test of the numbers that they do, and they do it on all their New Start patients. They test them when they come in, and they test them when they leave, and they only have 18 weeks, 18 days. Isn't that right? Something 18 days. 18 and they can see the difference in those cholesterols and triglycerides and what would you say on average that number? That's not four weeks, that's 18 days. Yeah, it's, um, it's actually close to that. I mean, it's probably average of 20% drop in cholesterol and 30 to 40% in triglycerides. And of course, the higher their levels when they come, the greater the improvement. Usually it's an indicator of the worst lifestyle, so they're right. making bigger changes. I had a patient who, uh, she came to Jim Brackett's program up north of Spokane, and she had come through the New Start and she would just kind of like, get, she knew all the answers, but she just wanted a five-day kind of kick program. But she brought me her printout of before and after. And before, her triglycerides were 340, and at 18 days, it was 120. I mean, that was a dramatic change. I mean, that was like a home run. 
Um, and it, but it was because her triglycerides were already pretty high and her cholesterol went down probably 25 points. But then the, the amazing thing is, and not, the, not unexpected, if these people stay on this program and keep making those choices, those numbers continue to fall. This is just the beginning. Goal number two, eat less trans fats. Um, the goal would be eat no trans fats. You know, that, that slide's wrong, it should say no. It's not that hard to eat no trans fats. The primary source of trans fats in the American diet are, look at this, fast foods, baked goods, snack foods, hard stick margarine, vegetable shortening, convenient foods with added fats, deep fried foods, things, things like um, pancake batter mix. That one's nasty. You know, I mean, there are some things that are particularly bad. Honestly, it just, it, it takes less time to make your own waffle mix or pancake mix than it does to go to the pantry and find the stuff. I mean, I don't know why people have to get it in a package. It costs three or four times more and it's profoundly less healthy. It doesn't taste as good. And it clearly doesn't taste as good. Trans fats and common snack foods, this just tells you some things. That these are all things you probably just shouldn't consume, but KFC chicken, I mean, all these you know, fast food restaurants, they're, it's very common that you'll find trans fats in, in their foods. Um, use trans fat free spreads. Um, this is hummus, tahini, olive oil, peanut butter, almond butter, mashed avocado. These are all good, healthy choices. Goal three, eat more healthy fats. Well, in fact, you have to be careful when you say this. You have to be really very careful when you say this. Because when people hear healthy fat, they go, aha. Uh -huh. You know, and they glom onto that. And if you look at the percent of fat intake, it may actually go up. So I don't tell people to eat more healthy fats. I go, the fats that you, you need to eat less fat. And the fats that you consume need to be chosen from the healthy varieties. And just leave it at that. I do not ever say eat more healthy fats, because they will. <laughs> linolenic fatty acid intake and mortality. A higher intake of linolenic fatty acids was found to be protective against heart disease. The relative risk was 0.41 for a 1% increase in calories from linolenic acid, which is about 2 to 3 grams, and we're going to talk about this. These are the alpha linoleic acids in foods, and this is, this is where you would find them. Um, flaxseed oil, look at that. Um, you know, a lot of people buy flaxseed meal, um, and the problem that I have with that is it's a healthy choice, um, but for about $10 you can get a coffee grinder, and you can get the flax seeds, and then you know when they were ground, right now. The flaxseed meal can go rancid, it can go bad, you don't know when it was done. So we don't, we kind of discourage people, you, it's another appliance, it, and most people already have a coffee grinder, they just put flaxseed in it, there's your flaxseed meal, you're done. All nuts and seeds, eat nuts and foods daily, we've already talked about this, we've already talked about that, you've seen that very slide. Nut consumption, heart disease, we've already seen this, it reduces your heart disease in half. The Harvard Nut Study, it compared to women who seldom or never ate nuts, those who ate an ounce of nuts five times a week had a 35% lower risk of heart disease. This was one of the 27 studies that was repeated. They all found between a 35 and a 55% reduction in heart disease. And these results held true even after holding constant for smoking, exercise, blood pressure, obesity, diabetes. So they eliminated all other factors and tried to look at just that one thing, nut consumption, and it still held true. How much fat should you eat? The National Cholesterol Education Program, the NCEP, recommends total fat less than 35% of calories. And boy, it, 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 we'd like to see it around 25%. You know, 35% is a pretty high number, but you've got to start somewhere because honestly, some of these people are over 50% of their calories are consumed in fat. And that's, it's, it's true. I mean, that just is true. So calculate saturated fat intake goal. Um, I don't really encourage this um, because I don't like calorie counting and I don't like, you know, what percent or what's what. If you just tell people, you know, it's got to be pragmatic and easy. If you tell them they have to use a calculator to eat, they're, they're going to get frustrated. So I don't really go through these little calculations because 
they, they don't ever get used, and they just bog down in the time of delivery of the program. We encourage people to eat lots of fresh fruits and vegetables. If you just start by having nine servings a day, you will have created such a healthier environment for them than what they came into your room with that you can't believe. Because if you're doing that, and then you also go along with some of the other program of encouraging them drinking plenty of water regularly and exercise, you will have gone a long ways. If you did nothing else but just those things, you will have given them such greater health than what they had. And then they come back and you build upon that building block which you've established. You're not going to build a building overnight. We're laying the foundation. Practical steps to reduce saturated fat in your diet. Don't eat it. Yeah. <laughs> Just don't do it. That's a pretty practical step. Um, use vegetable oils in place of solid fats and you know solid fat should just never be in your 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 choices and the way you get away from those you have you know the best first way that you can get a person who comes to your program to improve their fat intake is tell them to stay away from fast food restaurants and if they just did that you know it, it would go a long ways if you put people back in the kitchen and have them cook their own food try to keep them away from processed foods and just do a few things like eating beans and rice um, and fixing at home you would have gone just a huge long ways replacing one meal a day when you were eating fast foods and take something instead cook, cook it yourself if you can really impress for them and you can give them this data which will give them that that desire they can see a benefit in their life then they start doing that you have huge increases in their their longevity which they don't really care about because they won't know about for 40 years but they'll feel better they'll be more rested they'll have more energy at work they'll have more acuity and they will generally feel better and they'll come back and tell you that and without trying it they'll also lose weight in most situations um, this lady came back uh, we were uh, again I was up in Spokane and this lady came back she had gone through this program like six months before and she was talking about some of the benefits that she was having she was a diabetic and she she was uh, she was on um, a number of cholesterol lowering medications and she was on 12 medications total when she came to the program and this was six months later and she'd stayed on this program that we're defining here um, and, and even more so and she was going back to her doctor that day to get off of her last cholesterol lowering medication because her cholesterol is now 125 and the doctor was having a hard case to sell or telling her why she should stay on that last one. She was off all of her diabetic medications and she was all off she was off all of her medications. She had an appointment that afternoon and she goes, I don't care if he tells me to stay on it, I'm off it. That's it. She was off her last one and then we said, oh by the way, Mary, was there some other benefit? She goes, oh yeah, um, yeah, I lost 50 pounds. <laughs> It wasn't a weight control program. She was trying to get off her diabetic medications, getting off of her Lipitor and her other cholesterol lowering medications. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, she didn't even mention that. And she goes, oh, oh yeah, yeah, by the way, I did. I lost 50 pounds mm -hmm. in six months. Limit baked goods. And again, this is kind of a no-brainer. These are high calorically dense foods. And, you know, we'll talk about the definition of a calorically dense food, but it's kind of you know it's it's a processed food that has an unnaturally high density of calories um, use non-fat dairy products um, and you can take that for what it's worth um, I don't think there's a whole huge benefit for non-fat versus fat I mean we would really encourage people to actually get off the dairy and we would treat that carefully at how we would say it and just say the goal would be and give some evidence why you might want to think about reducing your dairy there was a recent article that came out like three days ago and it was talking about um, eating egg yolks and risk of heart disease did, did you pick up on that I, it was someone told me about it and, and it was in it was basically you know saying that eating the yolk of eggs um, was effectively one of the worst things you could do for your risk for coronary heart disease and that was I think in the New York Times I mean, this, this stuff is out there. This information is constantly out there in front of us. Eat fewer fried foods. And again, 
fewer, you know, some of these people are eating so many, um, and you can describe some of the data. There was a French study about three years ago that were looking at potato chips, and they noticed that when potato starch is subjected to high temperature, and that's achieved when you deep fat fry them because you typically fry them at about 425 degrees. And the reason they use oil, it's a very simple. The reason you would fry them instead of boil them is if you boil them at your sea level, you can only get them to 212 degrees. And so it's going to take a while and the end result's going to be different. The reason that oil is used is not necessarily the oil the taste is some, but because oil it, it's, it, you can cook it at a much higher temperature before it becomes a vapor. You know, most oils vaporize at you know, 500, 550 degrees. So you can cook it at a much higher temperature. But they did a study looking at the starch of potatoes, specifically with potato chips, and they identified after deep fat frying, and they identified a carcinogen. This starch changed chemically into a structure which they identified as carcinogenic. Now, what are french fries? Potatoes, how do they cook them? They are the same way. Now, the French study didn't look at french fries. They actually stopped. They just stopped the study. Very interesting. They just identified potato chips. They never went beyond that. But there is good evidence that certain starches are modified by high temperature. So irrespective of the oil, the fact that if you could broil, and someone asked me this question, what if you could broil a potato at 500 degrees? Would it be healthier for you than cooking it with oil? I see yes. When you look at chemically, the structure of that starch, temperature related, still going to happen. You're still going to have that bad chemical. You won't have the oil, but you will potentially have the starch converted to a bad chemical. So broiling a potato is most likely, I would say in my mind, a really bad idea. And people say, well, how should you cook things? Well, you should eat raw whenever possible. I mean, then you don't have to worry about cooking it. You know, it's pretty simply cooked. It's where it's supposed to be delivered. Steaming it would probably be the best way to cook something. Tomatoes, for example, it's great to eat some tomatoes, but you need to have some cooked tomatoes because the lycopenes are released. We know that some cooked tomatoes and some fresh tomatoes are both good. So. God must have intended that we cook some things because some things are better when cooked. Legumes, better when cooked. You know, the, the bioavailability of some of the nutrients. Steaming it. But the higher and higher temperatures that we cook become less and less beneficial to your health. Just remember that. Because the question will always come up in these discussions, and it's, it's amazing. It kind of depends on the community. The question will always come up about using microwaves. Because they talk about, they'll say nuke it. Well, that word nuclear, that's just a bad, <laughs> bad word, you know. And they'll say, well, doesn't that change it? Doesn't the DNA get changed? You know, it's like, well, just remember that it's about temperature. And we can talk about microwave, but the problem with microwaves is they get really hot in some, some parts because of the nature of it and cold in other parts. And you'll notice that when you take it out, some parts are hot, some parts are cold. And that's why they make carousels. That's why they make a move. You ever wonder why they do that? so they can get that so that there's hot and cold or mixed up and so everything is warm. But just remember that there's some parts that are really hot in a microwave depending on what you're using and it's the damage to food is temperature related. Deep fat frying them is probably the worst way that we currently know to cook a food. So microwave falls somewhere in between. So that's, that's the answer. Microwaving isn't as good as steam but it's sure better than deep fat frying. Okay? We're off task here, but it's interesting. Read food labels. Be careful when eating out. These are pragmatic, no-brainers. Reducing saturated fat at meals. We're not going to go through the calculation, but this is hamburger versus a garden burger. Look at the saturated fat difference. This is mayonnaise versus something else that's non-food. Um, this is cheese versus uh, non-fat cheese, which is a non-food. Um, French fries versus oven-baked potato wedges with some canola oil. So those are just interesting things. So we're here concluding three minutes to go. How about that? Time for a quiz. 
have to get my answer sheet. I'm tired. <laughs> For those of you who plan, and I hope most of you will plan on delivering this kind of message, done right, it can be pretty exhausting um, because you have, to, you have to put a lot of energy in it. People have to see the passion in your belief. You can really, really, really believe it. But if you don't have the passion for showing it, they're not going to see the belief. They're not going to see it. I'm even more passionate about this than how you see. And that has to come through to your audience. They have to feel how deeply you feel about this subject. And they also need to see how much you care about them. They need to see and feel that because when they see that you're there, you're desperate that they will have better health. And they realize and feel that, and they see that you care about them. You will make a connection that many times will be for life. That will be forever. Because you will be instrumental in saving their lives. That's huge. And they no one recognize that. And you're doing it out of the kindness of your hearts. And they will see that. But you have to, you have to kind of be an actor sometimes. Especially... The first night. The first night is very important. You have to kind of go overboard because you have to set the hook. You've got the bait. You've got to set the hook because they have to come back the second week. And they have to want desperately to come back. And so you have to kind of, and once you have them, you can kind of back off and then they're friends. And then the, your relationship changes. But the dynamics are just amazing. Were you stretching, Wadi, or had a question? Good for you. Okay. Cholesterol is found only in what kind of foods? Animals. 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 Period. Saturated fats do what to the risk of heart disease? Increasing. The only kind of fat required by the body is polyunsaturated fats. Um, the total fat intake ought to be no more than, this program says, 17. 35%. And we'd like to see it quite a bit less than that. Um, the lower you can get up to, it, it's pretty hard to get it lower than about 15 to 17 percent. I, I think it's, it's you know, almost impossible. But you know, at 35 percent, uh, I think some, I think, doesn't Esselstyn get some people down to 10 or 11 percent? And some of his really strict. I, I'm thinking. Yeah, I mean, but, you can get on a watermelon only. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you wouldn't live. <laughs> Okay, um, trans fatty acids are found in foods with what kind of vegetable oils? The partially hydrogenated. Um, number six, there are no trans fat acids in corn oil, margarine, true or false? False. All margins are made from vegetable oils, usually with partially hydrogenated vegetable oils, thus they have trans fatty acids. The margins that have liquid vegetable oil as their first ingredient have the least amount of trans fatty acids. Olive oil has no saturated fat in it. That would be false. All oils, listen to this, all oils have some of both saturated and unsaturated fats. Okay? It's the ratio that matters. Ounce for ounce, there is more saturated fat in American and Swiss cheese than in red meat. That is a true statement, folks. Mm -hmm. Low-fat milk has how many grams of saturated fat? It's actually five grams, because low-fat milk is 2%. Um, the kind of fat eaten is more important than the amount of fat eaten. That's, that's kind of true. <laughs> it's technically true. OK, how about that? The, the kind of fat you eat is more important than the amount. Um, the thing is, is they're, they're both important, but if you had to choose one, you would choose the kind of fat, but we would really like you to choose both. Okay? Any questions? Question. How come that Pastor Moore and I and the rest of the older people got this far when going through the 20s and the 30s, all we had was what came off on the farm? Well, the question is a good question. How come he's 92 years old and he was eating eggs and cheese and butter and he's 92 years old and how and, and he's in your life still? That's a really good question, right? He didn't die when he was 75. 
the important thing is, uh, there's a couple of important factors. One is, is you told me when you were on the farm. Mm -hmm. That was an important word you used, because you were on the farm. Mm -hmm. You were working. Like the cattle ate the grass, and yeah. they were grain. Chickens picked their own. Yeah. You were eating organic products. Right. You were eating, you, if you actually looked at the amount of red meat you were eating, you, you, it was actually pretty low. It was very low. Very low. And you were eating butter and eggs. Um, and eggs are a very, very good uh, distribution of amino acids, a very healthy protein. Um, and you were, you were getting cholesterol, but you were on the farm. You were working hard. And that um, mitigated a number of these factors. That was the important thing. But we now have an, a society that isn't agrarian now. We have people here on campus who are sitting down a long part of the day, who are sedentary, and they aren't on the farm. You know, the, the answer, the real answer is get back to the farm. Mm -hmm. But most of us can't get back to the farm. So we have to do other things. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? We're late by four minutes and he's standing there. No, no, no. I'm just standing here because I don't want to be sedentary. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another question. Uh, what about like waffle irons with starch? The, it, would that you consider that higher heat or that? Uh, a waffle iron, um, it, it kind of depends on the temperature. A waffle iron isn't uh, deep fat frying, but it's higher than steaming. Mm -hmm. But you know, um, I think I think don't worry about it. Yeah. You know, as you know, don't just say, well, that's going to be my major source. Um, you know, obviously the waffles we had at breakfast were cooked on a waffle iron. Um, we would not encourage people to spray, you know oil onto it before every single waffle uh, because you can, you know, if you do it right, you can just put it in non-stick. And most of the Teflon waffle irons are designed to be used at a lower temperature because at higher temperature the Teflon breaks down chemically and the manufacturers know that. And I haven't actually put a thermometer on those, but they tend to be lower temperature than the old kind of waffle irons that were metal, you know, without Teflon. Any other questions? Okay. So uh, that is a three-week program right there. <laughs> so listen, take your workbook, and um, there are activities that you would, were intended to do between each week. And we actually want you to fill those out, because we need you to do that for yourself personally. And so also you know what the participants will be doing. So that is a bit of your homework this afternoon, as if you had nothing else to do. But go through those three programs in your workbook and fill out the information in them. Um, and that will also imprint on your brain the important points in the program. Um, as you go over it and then repeat it, the repetition will increase percentage, percentage of, re of retention. Done. Thank you.